Phil, for having me. Um, so I don't know how many of you have already been in the clinic here. Maybe some of you know Dr. Cow. She was one of my teachers. So um, I did my sleep fellowship here. And I'm also a lung doctor. So lung and sleep. And um, I'll kind of try and show you how those two factor into what I'm going to talk about today. Oh, that's really sensitive. OK. So um, from a lung sleep doctor standpoint, we look at muscular um, or neuromuscular disorders as a big group of things that anywhere from up to the brain all the way down to the muscles that are surround the lung that can affect breathing, right? It's a very oversimplified approach. Obviously, we have one specific group of you here today up at the top, but more or less, that's kind of how we view it. There's a lot of different things that could affect the muscles of breathing um, in various parts of the body. Um, the most important muscles that we're talking about from our standpoint really have to do with the ones that help you breathe. So all the ones that kind of surround the rib cage here will be very helpful, not only with inhalation, but also exhalation. But really when we're talking about the most important muscle of all, it's the diaphragm. And that's that dome, it's this dome-shaped muscle that kind of sits underneath the chest, in between the chest and the belly. And as that muscle contracts, it pulls everything down, opens up the lungs, and lets air go in. Okay, so that's one of our most important muscles when it comes to breathing because if that becomes weak, then we have to think about ways to augment or help people breathe. Okay, it also, once these muscles start getting weak, we start worrying about poor cough and that sort of thing. Let's see, did I get that right? Sorry. Okay, so um, the, the evolution of, of breathing problems in neuromuscular disease follows this sort of pattern, meaning that folks will start out with, uh, with normal breathing. They'll start having breathing trouble in specific stages of sleep, so REM sleep or dream sleep, then REM and non-REM sleep, and then, and then it'll progress to the daytime. Now, why the heck would it matter what stage of sleep you're in? So some may be more familiar with this than others, but this is a, a snapshot of a normal night's sleep. So you can see at the top there, that's wake to begin the night over here. Do I even have a pointer? I guess that's not really... I'll just reach over at the top there. That's wake. This patient then goes into to deeper sleep, so stage two and three. So this is non-REM sleep. They cycle up and down, so they have some brief wake-ups, which is normal between stage two and three sleep. And then they go into REM sleep or dream sleep, which is these black bars here. And they cycle usually. That that cycle usually goes on and off about every 90 minutes in anyone. Uh, that's sort of normal sleep, more or less. Okay. When anyone is sleeping we're all obviously very relaxed our muscles are relaxed we breathe less forcefully than we do when we're awake um, and during non-REM sleep so no dreaming sleep we still have access to our muscles of the diaphragm and of the chest and and, um, and belly they're they're diminished like I said we don't we're all very relaxed but they're still there at least it turns out that when you go into dream sleep when anyone goes into dream sleep the um, access into the diaphragm is really the only muscle you have left. So all of this is gone. It's really all you have is the diaphragm to rely upon for breathing during sleep. And so you can see that if you're someone who has a neuromuscular disease to begin with, once you start going into REM sleep or dream sleep, things could start to show themselves that you wouldn't necessarily see in other people, breathing problems, etc. Okay. And then as that gets worse, you would see it in REM sleep, non-REM sleep, and then progressing eventually to the daytime. Okay. And that's a problem because it's not only a matter of getting oxygen into the lungs, but also carbon dioxide out. So it's a two-element two, uh, two problem. Um, not only are you, getting, are you not getting oxygen into the body, into the tissues, but you're not expelling the waste that the lungs normally do. What are the symptoms of this? So um, people can often complain of frequently waking up. So when the body's not getting enough oxygen in or enough carbon dioxide out, it'll, it's a stimulus to wake people up because the body feels kind of like it's, it's sort of like a choking state, right? It's not getting the necessary gases in or out. So there's frequent awakenings, there's snoring, you might hear people have breathing pauses, um, even getting up to have to go to the bathroom a lot, that sort of stuff, uh, muscle cramps, that kind of thing. And then when it progresses to the daytime, we see more classic symptoms of just breathing problems in general. So shortness of breath, 
uh, even when talking or minimal activity, shortness of breath when laying down or being flat, uh, the weak cough I mentioned, difficulty clearing the secretions, um, uh, also just this daytime fatigue, needing to take longer naps, etc., because the sleep you had the night before wasn't very restful. So you, you all probably may know this better than I do, to be honest, because you, you've probably seen some of this, but the way we monitor this or, or watch for it is in the, in the neuromuscular clinic, oftentimes you come in, almost every, maybe even every time you come in, you'll get some kind of respiratory function testing. Some kind, you'll huff and puff into a, a, a meter that gives us the flow rates and how strong your cough is and all that sort of stuff. So that's kind of the number one there. Number two, sometimes we can just measure oxygen levels, so I'll put a little little monitor on your finger. You can do that just in the clinic or you can even do it overnight to see how the oxygen is going. Uh, or you can even uh, do some of this through blood testing. So you can stick a uh, blood sample from the wrist and see how the oxygen and carbon dioxide levels are. But then one thing you might not think about is sometimes we do a sleep study. So we actually look at how you're doing during the night when you sleep to get a sense of how well are things going because remember that respiratory difficulty may start in sleep before it gets to the awake time. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with sleep studies. There's different forms of them, but they kind of look something like this. They hook you up to a bunch of bells and whistles and monitor a lot of different things when you sleep. Um, again, there's different ways to do it, so that's not the only way, um, but it gives us an idea. This is the oxygen monitor right here. It gives us an idea of how well the lungs are functioning during sleep, among other things. There's, there's other things that are measured as well. Um, so, given what I've just told you, you can sort of kind of understand in terms of what we like to see or what we recommend from sleep and what we recommend not to do, what, we, what sleep hygiene we like. So, given that sleep is a vulnerable time for your, your breathing muscles um, and you want to keep them as strong as possible, you want to avoid any kind of medications or um, substances that are going to make things more difficult for you. So. Uh, things that are going to, uh, medications that are, gonna that are supposedly going to help you sleep might actually make things weaker. Um, sedating medications, it's a benzodiazepine is uh, the one I was referencing there. Pain medication, narcotics. Now, of course, if people are in chronic pain, we have to treat that, but it's a balance between making sure that they're sleeping okay. And also things like muscle relaxants, because that can only make, that can sometimes make breathing worse at night. Um, and then oxygen. So, um, Paradoxically, you would think that oxygen might help, but remember, it's a two-step process. It's not only getting oxygen in, it's getting carbon dioxide out. Give, giving more oxygen to go in doesn't necessarily help the other out process, unless you're using something called a respiratory assist device, which is what I want to talk to you about now. Um, it's just the in and out again. So respiratory assist devices, and again, I'm getting to the point of the talk where some of you may know way more about this from a practical standpoint than I do, meaning that you've used it before. So um, Forgive me if I go over things you already know, um, but our, the respiratory assist devices come in generally two flavors. One is sort of the least invasive, meaning it, it's just a mask that's attached to you. So, for instance, these are the machines themselves. They're about you can see how big they are, about the you know size of half half your arm, um, and sit on your bedside table. And then they connect to you via tubing and a mask that that sits on the face. Okay, so that's sort of the least invasive because it doesn't involve any kind of um, tracheostomy or those sorts of things. Okay. Um, and to be more specific, just so you understand, these are actually what are called bi-level devices. So you'll start at a, uh, when you're breathing, uh, the devices will give you one pressure, so pressure number one. When you inhale, you get a second pressure, so you get higher pressure. And then as you breathe out, you get that drop back to the first pressure. So it's this up and down action that allows for not only air and oxygen to come in, but that release to get carbon dioxide out. And that's what the, diff the main difference is between just giving someone oxygen, for instance. So that's why this is necessary. Um, the advantages to these are that they're small, relatively small, about the size of you know, a laptop or a little bit, little bit less. Small, lightweight, quiet. Um, they uh, used to be a lot louder, but they're a lot quieter now. Um, remote monitoring, that means that if you do, if your doctor does decide that this is something that's um, good for you, when you are at home, they can nowadays can log into a computer and actually see your account, see how you're using it, seeing whether it's 
the settings are working for you, whether they need to be adjusted, that sort of thing. Um, and they have data cards also. So if you come into clinic, you can just bring a data card. And so it's not like you're lugging this around too much. It usually stays at home. The disadvantages of the mask only ones of the respiratory assist devices are that they have to be plugged in. They're basically sitting at your bedside. They're for sleep. Um, you can travel with them. You just have to pack them up. But you can't you know, take them with you on, say, the chair in, uh, during the daytime, for instance. Um, the, the modes that they use, meaning the kinds of breathing patterns they can help support, are fairly limited. It's just that sort of, for the most part, it's sort of that up and down like I talked about. Um, I'll talk about some more advanced modes later, but there's no mouthpiece, mouthpiece ventilation, which I'll talk, also talk about in a second. And then that they're just the non-invasive type, so just the mask, no, no tracheostomy connection. Okay. Um, I, a quick note on this is you may have heard about maybe your uncle or someone has sleep apnea and, and they're, on, they're using something called CPAP. Well, it turns out these devices provide that too. So if someone just has good old-fashioned sleep apnea, um, they, they might be using it. But that's not what's going on here. So it's a slight distinction. But sleep apnea, as you may know, is a condition where the uh, soft tissue at the back of the throat gets narrowed there when we sleep. And so there's this kind of choking effect. And so we provide some positive airway pressure, just like the, what I just showed you, to those folks so that they can keep that area open and keep breathing. Um, people with neuromuscular disease are perfectly entitled to have sleep apnea as well, so we, we may be treating both. But the point is, is that when we treat people who just have sleep apnea, not neuromuscular disease, um, we're not giving them this up and down kind of thing like I talked about. We're giving them one straight pressure the whole night, just enough to keep those two areas of soft tissue away from each other so that the patient can keep breathing on their own. Um, it's kind of, I kind of liken it to your dog sticking your head out of its car because it's getting that one pressure the whole time. It's not going up or down, um, which can actually, if you were to use something like that in folks with neuromuscular disease, you can actually get into trouble because it's harder to exhale. You can see with the, the red line there, you get this kind of nice release and it allows the lungs to empty. Whereas someone with just CPAP or one pressure, you have this kind of load to exhale against. So your doctors know all about this and, and when you see them in the clinic, no one's no one should be prescribing CPAP, but it's just something to think about in terms of the differences of what, of what those, those machines can offer. Um, so the next thing is, has to do with mask options. So this, like I said, has to be connected to a mask that you wear. And there's basically three types of masks out there. There's one that goes under the nose, over the nose, or over the nose and mouth. And everything from there is kind of a variation on that, to be honest. So some of the newer ones I'll just show you. Um, this one here basically goes under the nose, but what you can see is that the air actually comes down through the mask itself, and the hose, instead of being in front like with these, is actually out the back of the head. So um, it can actually kind of free you up in the front so you don't have things um, tangled in front of your face when you're trying to sleep. This other one, which is these three pictures, is a, is a newer one that's basically over the nose and mouth, but it kind of sits under the nose instead of over the nose. So there's, there's a little bit of variation out there. Um, it does have the hose in the front, so there's sort of give and take depending upon which model you, you use. Um, these are just kind of rehashing what I said. The, the first one that goes under the nose is kind of the smallest, lightest, but, but can be moved rather easily at night. The one going over the nose is um, a little bit of a nice balance between the two. And then the full face mask is the most stable, but of course it's kind of the biggest and the most, um, the biggest footprint at night. So the, the, I'll talk about it more later, but the, but the biggest point in all that is just finding one that works for you. It does, it's like a pair of shoes. If a certain set of shoes is comfortable for you, perfect. You're done looking. It does, it, we, don't, we don't tell them, tell any patient they have to use one mask or the other as long as it's comfortable and working. Um, the respiratory assist devices are one of the most important uh, treatment tools we have to alleviate symptoms of um, breathing difficulty, to improve quality of life and survival. Um, and there, your doctor may start these or discuss them with you sooner or later, it depends. Um, a lot of what they do when they're doing that breathing testing when you come into the clinic is to try and assess how strong are the muscles of breathing. and where are we going? Are we, are we headed down this way? Are we steady? 
um, because after a while, if the muscles get too weak, we might have to help with one of the devices I mentioned. So that's, that's kind of what that testing is all about. Um, so I talked to you about the mask only. The next main category has to do with portable ventilators. So these are more advanced devices um, with more capability. So they look like this, a little bit, uh, I know it's hard to know the scale here, I'll show you in a second. Um, Trilogy and Astral, these are two different portable ventilators, just two of the main uh, companies that are on the market now. Um, and they are a little bit bigger, I'll show you here if you, if you uh, I'll show you in the next slide. But the advantage of these over the mask only is that they are portable and they actually have battery operation so they don't have to stay plugged in. Um, and then they have the advanced modes of breathing, which I, I'll, I'll mention. And then the capability of mouthpiece ventilation. So um, I think you guys kind of know what that is. He was talking about sip and puff and that sort of stuff. So I don't have to talk too much about that, but um, at least gives me a chance to show you that this is the portable ventilator up at the right corner. It's actually sitting on the back of the chair here. So, um, and then in this case with the mouthpiece ventilation, uh, there's some tubing that's connecting the ventilator through this arm here with the mouthpiece at the end. So there's the sip and puff capability, but you don't have that with the other respiratory assist devices. Like I mentioned, those are just for sleep at home. Okay. Um, yeah, I was just going to talk about mouthpiece ventilation, which is a nice option because it's sort of an in-between, um, step between having someone with a breathing device all the time and just at, at, at night. Um, you can use it as much as you need. If you have symptoms, uh, they can sip and, and uh, uh, get relief of uh, shortness of breath or dyspnea. And then it can also improve cough because you can stack breaths a little bit and help um, expel um, any uh, secretions you have. Uh, so anyway, so, so back to this. Um, these can be used either invasively or non-invasively. So um, as I mentioned, the first one, it's, it's a mask only system. This one can be used with the tracheostomy. And just so everyone's aware, uh, again, maybe oversimplifying things, but tracheostomy is the next step in securing something into the breathing pipe. So that involves actually making uh, a communication between the, air, the, the main windpipe and the outside skin here and actually placing a tube in so it sits here throughout the day. And that's what this patient has here. You can then connect the tubing, like I said, straight to this. And with the portable ventilators, not the first group of, of respiratory assist devices, but the, the portable ventilators, then you can ventilate or, or breathe for the patient pretty much 24 seven. Um, so there's the, the portable ventilator. But again, with these respiratory assist devices, that does not work with the tracheostomy. Um, I guess I'll take questions at the end, but I'm going to switch gears just a bit here. So that, that has to do with, with actual breathing devices. What we uh, wanted to talk about next was therapies for ineffective cough. So as you can imagine, as those muscles get weaker, the diaphragm and those around the respiratory cage, it's not just a problem of breathing in and breathing out, but when you cough, you have to generate very high pressures in your lungs and in your chest in order to expel uh, any kind of secretion. So it actually takes a lot more strength than, than we realize. And as the mus respiratory muscles get weaker, then we have trouble clearing the secretion. So what do we have in terms of technology that can help us with that? So the first one is cough assist device. This is another respironics device that, um, pretty simple really. Uh, what it does, and some of you again may, have, may be using this or have seen this, so you know more than I do, but um, basically what it does is it, it'll do several breaths of inhalation. So it'll give um, three or four breaths of flow into the lungs, and then it'll reverse flow and actually draw air back out. So air inhalation in, inhalation in, inhalation in, and then negative pressure so that air gets reversed out of the lungs and brings with it secretions. Okay. And this can be used with help from a therapist or once the patient gets comfortable with it on their own, um, can be up to every four hours, depending upon how needed, how, how often it's needed. And then another one, which we see more in the, the lung world with people with lung diseases, specifically like cystic fibrosis, those sorts of things is the vest, which is kind of nice. It's, um, 
the, the newer versions are coming out, but basically uh, get the patient wrapped in a, in a vest uh, garment kind of thing, buckled in, and then connected to this um, device that basically vibrates the, the vest over a period of time, and that kind of shakes loose the secretions from the deep lower airways up to more towards the, the uh, shallow airways so that, that the, the secretions can be coughed up. And again, that can be used multiple times a day if needed. Um, just another, just some of the benefits. Preventing respiratory infections is really what we're after because as those muscles get weaker, as those secretions stay there and don't mobilize, that can lead to pneumonia, infections, needing to go to the hospital, et cetera, which can lead to a lot of problems. Um, and then again, can be used at least twice daily if needed. Um, the uh, benefits for using the respiratory assist device or the ventilator. So um, we're looking at trying to improve people's sleep quality so that they uh, don't have trouble getting the oxygen in, the carbon dioxide out, which are both stimuli for awakening, awakening people at night. Um, with that, we tend to see, um, as we improve people's sleep, we tend to see more daytime alertness, more daytime energy, uh, increased energy, excuse me, increased energy level. And then the muscle weakness progression s tends to slow. So folks who have these kinds of devices can actually live longer because they're able to clear the secretions, et cetera. And then de delay time to the, the need for a tracheostomy. Um, the side effects of these sort of things tends to, especially with the first group of respiratory assist devices, has mostly to do with the mask. And this is something we run into with the sleep apnea patients is, unfortunately, at the end of the day, we still have to have this mask attached to the face in some way. And so um, either the, the, the mask won't be fitted perfectly and there'll be some leak of air out of it. Um, there'll be, it'll cause dry nose, dry mouth, congestion, skin breakdown around the mask, which I can talk about in a second. Um, and then just a little bit of claustrophobia, tough time getting used to that. Um, so this is just a quick slide talking about the most common side effects, but most of them kind of go up into this area of problems with mask. Um, and these are just some things, I like to tell people that we may run into trouble with this, either skin problems, skin breakdown, that sort of thing, but we almost always have some kind of solution. We just have to work through it. So for instance here, this is someone who maybe had some skin breakdown on the top of their nose, but we have all kinds of things on the market to uh, provide a buffer between the mask and the nose so you don't get skin breakdown, but you still do get um, adequate delivery of of um, air throughout the night. Um, so like I said, whatever the problem is, we just we almost always have some kind of solution. It's just one of these things that we have to work with the patient over a, a set period of time. Um, very rarely do you hand everyone the, the equipment and they, they fly to it right away. Um, but again, if we, if we follow you up and, and work with you uh, enough, we'll, we'll get things situated. So things like eliminating leak, helping with uh, eye irritation, um, et cetera. Nasal congestion, medications can be used, humidity. Um, bloody nose, really not too much of a problem, but again, can be treated. Same with runny nose, et cetera. And then because we are pumping air down into the windpipe, it sometimes can sneak down into the, to the, the stomach and cause a little bit of discomfort. But again, that's usually a problem that goes away fairly quickly or there's things we can do to alleviate that as well. Um, and so just a quick uh, emphasis point on choosing the right mask. Um, as long as we're following up and, and um, discussing what's working and what's, what's not, we're usually able to find some kind of device that works well. And that's it. Thank you guys so much. Any questions? Sure. Yeah. Sure. So the question was, um, I guess during allergy season, there was a lot more cough, trouble with cough, and it, I assume during the daytime, nighttime, all times. Daytime. daytime. Okay. Yeah, so um, in that regard, you'd 
probably be best to usually medical therapy is is key because if you're not if the allergies aren't controlled during the daytime they're probably going to make breathing harder not only during the daytime but potentially at night and then sleep gets worse and then the cough gets worse because you didn't sleep well and so it can get be a bit of a vicious cycle so either seeing an allergy doctor um, or getting on the right medications so allergies come in different forms you know is it more runny nose is it more um, cough that sort of thing is there any asthma involved too that kind of thing um, so I don't you know sometimes it's nice to see someone who's either a lung doctor or an allergist who can kind of treat both um, because there's there's different medications depending upon what the problem is yes sir so uh, you said like diaphragm is the most important muscle right so I can guess like the aqua therapy is like breathing inside the water and then yoga breathing right so is there any mm -hmm. like recommended protocol or thing to strengthen that thing early before when the boys are younger so that it can provide uh, uh, some more strength in their later life? Yeah, that's a good question. So is there really anything to do in terms of keeping the diaphragm strong so that the breathing can um, continue, you know, as strong as it can? It really, I, I say that if you think about the general health measures just for anybody, you know, um, maintain a, a, a normal weight because if you think about it, if you put a big belly here that diaphragm has to contract against a force so if you keep things slim here that's helpful any kind of exercise is, as we talked about earlier is going to help every muscle in the body so that if you exercise you have to breathe a little deeper a little faster that strengthens the the diaphragm or keep at least keeps it active so this is why you know doctors say eat right get some exercise is half the 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 game because it's already going to take care of most of that for you. In terms of yoga breathing, that sort of stuff, again, I mean, very helpful for not just for the diaphragm, but other things as well. So, yeah, I don't think there's anything more specific, any kind of um, additional things we would recommend. But as long as, but you, you kind of see why, you know, we tell folks to, to do the things we do because it'll help, you know, the, the key functions of breathing, et cetera. Questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I was just curious about um, uh, monitoring the efficacy of, of the treatment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for a lot of guys uh, with mobility issues and contractors, coming into a sleep lab is a challenge. Yeah, so for sure. Um, how, what do you think about home testing to, to see how things are going? Um, it's, it's a really good question. Um, the uh, I will say that the, the, the in-lab sleep tests are a lot more amenable, I think, to a, a, a variety of patients than they used to be. Um, I think it used to be, you know, sort of the, um, the, the in-lab testing was, was designed purely for people who were worried about sleep apnea. They'd walk in, walk out. Now we have different things that are, that are looking at that. You have um, continuous carbon dioxide in, what, in addition to the oxygen overnight. You have sleep techs who are better trained at, to a variety of patients. So I do think that the in-lab sleep studies have become a little friendlier for that. As far as the home studies go, probably good enough to see whether or not the oxygen level is really dipping during the night and if there's any sleep apnea. But you don't get the carbon dioxide, um, you don't get the brain waves, that sort of stuff. So um, probably, not, probably not perfect for this uh, disease group. Um, but again, I think the, the, um, the in-lab testing is probably getting a little bit more friendly with that, especially at centers like Stanford where, you know, we have relationships. Dr. Cow goes back and forth between the two places. We kind of understand what the needs are of every patient, et cetera. Okay. Great. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it.